Hello, everybody. Craig Deleuze here with the Firearms Policy Coalition. Welcome back to Morning Coffee with Craig, where we talk about all things firearms, firearms policy, politics, culture, media, you name it. We're talking about it right here on Coffee with Craig. So please take a moment, like and share the program, and encourage your friends to do the same. Uh, now, what I want to do right now is the other day I got a chance to record an interview with Dr. John Lott and Holly Sullivan of the Crime Prevention Research Center. Unfortunately, it took me a little bit to get my stuff together to be able to get it up, so I want to go ahead and get it up for you today so that you, got, you folks could, uh, could check it out. In any case, thank you so very much, and I uh, hope you enjoy the interview. Thank you so much. Welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having us. Excellent, excellent. Now, Dr. Lott, we'll, we'll start with you. I'm, you have been doing what you've been doing for, oh man, for, how, how long have you actually been doing and studying and putting out information and statistics uh, relating to uh, uh, self-protection regarding, uh, uh, self, regarding self-defense? Right, well, I mean, I've been doing crime uh, since I got yeah. my PhD uh, back in the 80s. But uh, gun stuff, I was never really that interested in it. Kind of got into it by accident. But uh, I suppose my work first got attention in 96 and uh, kind of been stuck with it since then. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's hard for those of us who do media and we're trying to find information and data on stuff. And, and when, in particular, when you hear some of these statistics that are put out there by anti-gun groups, it's, it's a real challenge to find the problems with the data or right. really come to understand uh, how they are misusing uh, information data or misrepresenting it. Uh, how do you go about dissecting or taking apart the stuff, the work uh, that some of these groups do? Well, uh, I mean, I suppose it's, I've had a lot of training with statistics and stuff. You learn how to go through things, but you also just know the data. You know, so, we were just talking at lunch about one of the claims that are out there about, uh, you know, the claim that the highest, the riskiest thing for kids are guns in terms of the death rate for kids. And it's simply false, and it's false for many ways. Even if you want to include uh, 18 and 19 year olds as kids, um, you know, there are things like just understanding what's the difference between homicide and murder. Mm -hmm. Do you really want to go and add in justifiable homicide there in terms of the totals that are there. You know, that changes it whether you include that or not. Um, and, you know, there are lots of things. I've worked as uh, chief economist for the U.S. Sentencing Commission. I've worked more recently in the Department of Justice dealing with statistics. It's just kind of learning what types of things are being measured. I mean, I'll give you another example. Um, uh, over half of murders involve acquaintance murders. Uh, most people think that if you're talking about an acquaintance murder, you're talking about some type of emotional close relationship between people. In fact, the vast majority of acquaintance murders involve rival gang members. It's very common right. for the members of one gang to know who the members of another gang are. Right. Acquaintance murders include things like a taxi cab driver who has a fare in the back of the car, mm -hmm. and if the person kills him or robs him, uh, that's those are classified as acquaintance crimes because there was a financial relationship that existed mm -hmm. between them. But that's not what most people think about. Right. And unfortunately, uh, most people in the media are either ignorant of these types of things mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, just... <laughs> Don't well, really care just, to know the truth. <laughs> well, there's just a lot yeah. of things that you pick up over time uh, yeah. there. But, uh, uh, you know, there I can go through a whole list of other claims mm -hmm. that are there. But, you know, things like uh, the frequent claim that the United States is somehow unique in terms of mass public shootings. You know, it's just a question of spending the time to go and say, well, you know, is that true or not? And then if you want to wonder, we spent like $70,000 going through and collecting uh, mass public shootings from around the world that were there. And what you find is that the United States makes up about 1% of the world's mass public shooters, even though we make up about almost 5% of the world population. So we're way below the world average. Right. But you'll see things like mass public shootings. Um, they'll go and just count the number of attacks in different countries. That's kind of like going and comparing 
the number of murders in uh, in California with the number of murders in Connecticut or in Rhode Island or someplace like that. Right. A any reporter in the United States would put it in terms of a per capita rate that's there. Right. You know, there's a lot more people that live in California. California could be safer, and you would still have more total murders right. that would be occurring there. But for some reason, you know, that type of critical discussion just seems to go out the window uh, for certain types of issues. Now, uh, you, you and Holly Sullivan are here, and uh, you're promoting, what is it? Stalker Awareness Month. Stalker Awareness Month, that is it. So you're promoting Stalker Awareness Month. So tell us a little bit about how this kind of came to be. Sure. So um, John and I actually wrote an op-ed that was published uh, in a paper in Connecticut, um, as well as some national publications, um, talking about stalkers and, and you know sort of the risks around it, but also around the guidance and information that they're given. But the piece of information that stalking victims typically are not given is to obtain a firearm and learn how to use it. Mm, okay. All right. They're told to do all sorts of other things, right. like change their life, change their job, change their name. Uh, you know, if you're going to go shopping, have a relative or a friend go with you. Move in with a friend or a relative. Move out of a place by yourself. Once in a while, they may be told things like get martial arts training. But the one thing that would be by far the most effective thing is the groups that advise women just refuse to go and mention guns. I, you know, it could be that they're liberals to begin with and they just don't want to talk about those things. But it's really a disservice and it makes them have to bear all sorts of costs in terms of radically changing their lives and it may not make them much safer than going and it makes them probably less safer than if they were to actually get a gun for protection right actually firearms being quite honestly the great equalizer right. whether you are you know six foot two 220 pounds or you are you know five foot one you know 102 pounds uh, you, you, you now have the ability to be able to defend yourself, in particular if you've taken the time to get training on how to properly be able to defend yourself. It sounds like they're not against the idea of training, they just don't want you training with a firearm. And even in that, any sort of self-defense is kind of rare. Um, self-defense training in general is somewhat rare with these groups. It seems that the overwhelming majority tell them to change their behaviors and their habits, um, but it doesn't seem like a lot of advocacy is given to any kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat or anything, any other means, no physical means. You know, the thing is, a lot of these women may have relatively lower incomes to begin with. You'd want them to change their jobs, so they're not going to have as good of a job probably as they did before. You just compound a lot of the problems that they're already facing. Right. So in other words, put you in a situation where rather than uh, rather than be able to defend yourself, they want you to, change, like you said, change your entire life. And, you know, that really just ends up making the victim a, a bit further rewinds up victimizing. Right. Yeah, exactly. All right. How can folks learn a little bit more about Stalker Awareness Month? Um, so actually, I'll refer to, to John on this and the Crime Prevention Research Center website. Um, yeah, well, well, I mean, we have things like the op-eds that uh, Holly mentioned that we wrote there or right up there on our website. People can go and read them, and there are links to different facts that are there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there are lots of things that can be done. Uh, so you talk about guns, but it's just not telling good guns. In Connecticut, uh, if a woman... Is, is understands that she should get a concealed carry permit to protect herself. Even after she's done the training, you're talking about a two-month lag before she's right. going to be granted the permit there. And in some places in Connecticut, it could be over a year. A woman may not be able to wait two months to be able to go and protect herself. Mm -hmm. Harm may have already occurred at that point. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, and you have the costs that are there. If you're talking about a single mother with kids, uh, she may not have a few hundred dollars extra to go and pay for the cost of the permit, let alone the cost of the training that's going to be there. So there are lots of things that I think we need to talk about. Uh, so for example, if a woman has a restraining order against somebody, why not let her carry while she's waiting for her permit to go and be approved? Why not make it so that women or people who are being stalked who are relatively poor uh, don't have to pay several hundred dollars to be able to go and get a permit or have the state even provide them with training on that or at least a voucher so they can go and get training for those types of things. 
you know, it's just, instead, you know, they give them the order of protection. But, you know, as Holly will say quite easily, in fact, I could let you talk about that, you know, what good is the order of protection going to do? Sure. So one of the, you know, one of the things that the violating a protective order is a nominal charge on top of murder, right? So right. if somebody's intent on killing somebody or doing a serious physical harm, they're not particularly worried about that add-on charge that could be dismissed anyway. Right. Um, so you know, so absolutely, I, I, you know, we really need to get serious about who the folks are that are out there and what we're really doing about it to empower women in particular to defend their lives and not just tell, give them other solutions like they should be quitting their jobs or go grocery shopping at other times. Those are not reasonable solutions to a very serious threat. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I really do believe, and we're now in a society where it seems like the people who are the victimizers are being treated like the victims, and people who are potential victims are being treated, you know, like, like they're the criminals. Yeah. Right. No, I mean, the whole criminal justice system, I, I was chief economist at the U.S. Sentencing Commission and I've worked in the Department of Justice. The whole criminal justice system is really geared to the rights of the criminal rather than the victim. You know, I'll give you an example. Uh, you look at something like the right to a speedy trial. Lots of states will have codes about victims' rights where they'll say the victim has a right to a speedy trial. But, and the criminal also. But the thing is, there's explicit rules and, and penalties put in with regard to the criminal not getting a, a, a speedy trial. For the victim, it's just worse. So I know victims who have had trials delayed five or six times before it finally occurs. You know, people don't understand what it's like for a victim to prepare, particularly somebody who's not used to speaking in public or whatever, to have to gear up and get ready to go and testify. They're worried, what will the defense attorney do to me? Are they going to attack me in some way? And so, you know, they have nightmares reliving these crimes before they go and testify. And then you get into court or the day before and you're told, well, uh, we're gonna delay it two more months. And so, essentially, it's just this torture over and over again with these victims that are there. And, you know, I don't think, most people kind of, unless you're, you know crime victims, and look, I worked in the criminal justice system, and when I was first working in it, I didn't know victims per se. You may have somebody come in, and you may talk to them, but it's a lot different when you actually go and, and, and live with somebody who's like that. And I don't, I'm not sure, I know virtually no academics who study these things kind of really appreciate this because the vast majority of academics are kind of higher income type individuals, they're well educated, they live in safe areas. Um, and most of the people in law enforcement, they almost become inured, they become desensitized because they just briefly see people coming through one after another. They don't see all the torture that the people have to go through in these things. Well, thank you so much for the for, first of all, for, for bringing this uh, to our awareness and letting us know and letting our, our viewers know uh, about Stalker Awareness Month. And, and uh, now, is there a specific website or is it all on your website? Well, you go to crimeresearch.org. We'll okay. have a lot of the information that's there. Excellent. excellent. Everything we've talked about is there. Well, thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you. Uh, we very much appreciate you having you on and uh, hope to have you on again sometime soon. Well, thank you. Right. Thank, thank you. you so very much. If you like our videos, follow, subscribe, like, and share.